name is Scotty James. I'm one of the pastors. Let's do it. If you have a Bible, 1 Samuel chapter 20 is where we'll begin. 1 Samuel chapter 20. And we'll look at verses 41 and 42. And then we'll immediately jump to 2 Samuel. So 1 Samuel chapter 20, verses 41 and 42. It'll be up on the screen if you don't have a Bible. Or you can write it down. And I'll read it. It says, After the boy had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone and bowed down before Jonathan three times with his face to the ground. Then they kissed each other and wept together, but David wept the most. Jonathan and David, Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left and Jonathan went back to the town. Skip ahead to 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 26. This is David's words. David says, I grieve for you. Jonathan, my brother, you were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. All right. So what in the world was that? (laughs) Right? David and Jonathan hugging, embracing, kissing each other, weeping together. David saying Jonathan's love was more sweet than the love of a woman. Tell me you don't feel a little tension, right? A little, this feels inappropriate. Hugging and weeping and and kissing between men gives the impression that this is some sort of same-sex romance. That's what that means to us. But if you know the Bible, you know that David was, that wasn't David's, it wasn't David's deal. He was a man after God's own heart. Yes, he had his flaws, but same-sex romance wasn't something that David was involved in. And so what's going on here? Why does this feel, feel so weird? I believe the reason why it feels weird to us is because we don't understand healthy intimacy. Intimacy is relational closeness. It's connectedness and familiarity. And our understanding of intimacy is so dysfunctional and so broken that we see healthy intimacy and we think it's wrong, and we see shallow intimacy and we think it's right. We're what's called a very sexualized society. And so we have very few non-sexual expressions of affection. And so today, if non-sexual expressions of affection are pretty much handshakes and awkward side hugs, (laughs) right? Where you touch them, but you try not to get cooties, Outside of that, we don't really have any form of of affection to give that's non-sexual. And so we see David and Jonathan hugging and weeping and kissing, and we think romance immediately. But what if David and Jonathan's relationship wasn't inappropriate? What if it actually was a picture of healthy intimacy? What if God actually has designed human relationships to be far more intimate than what we're normally experiencing in our culture? See, I think... The weirdness that we feel is not because of their relationship. I think the weirdness has more to do with, with something in us. So if you're new, we've been going through a series asking the question, what does it mean to be human? Or how do we live fully in our humanity? And I believe we have very much an identity crisis. We're humans, but we don't really know what that means. And so we take our cues from what the world says and what culture teaches us. But the problem with that is that culture, actually, if we listen to them, it dehumanizes us. We've got to go to the Word of God and get our cues from what he says humanity was meant to be. So that's what we've been doing. And before we move forward today, we have to sort of revisit what we touched on last week. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Genesis 2, verse 18. Again, if you don't have a Bible or if you don't know where Genesis is, you can just look up on the screen. which I'll read. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. 
So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this now is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Verse 25, Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So we talked about this last week. To, to be human is to be unashamed. God made Adam and Eve to live shameless lives. Shame was never part of God's original plan for humanity. But when they sinned, they stepped out of faith, and they stepped into this new reality that is ridden with shame. And now, since the world is tainted by shame, I feel secure when I hide. My feelings of security come not from me being open, but instead from me being covered, me hiding. And not just my body, but my, my soul as well. I work hard to hide. I work hard to present to you a false self, to present to you a phony version of me that I believe you'll like, that I believe you'll accept. And so I hide behind social trends, and I hide behind my money, and I hide behind my body, and I hide behind shallow relationships because a great majority of my life consists of me hiding because I feel secure when I hide. And all this hiding comes from shame because shame is, is this fear, this, this disappointment that I don't measure up. It's this feeling that, you know, I'm not good enough. I'm not enough. And I think if we were to look into the, the human soul, if we had glasses somehow that could see into our souls, I think we'd be dumbfounded by how much shame is at the root of what we do. When you peel back the layers of depression, I'm not saying every case is this, but I think you'd find many cases when you peel back depression, there's shame deep down in there. I'd say that a great majority of ambition, not all ambition, but a great amount of ambition is actually driven by shame. You see this in the, the church. My church doesn't measure up. Those churches, the big church with the multiple campuses, that's the standard that I should be at. So I've got to live up to that, and I've got to launch more services, and I've got to have more campuses. And I'm not saying if you have multiple campuses or if you have multiple locations that you're driven by shame. That's not the point. But what I am saying is that, that that ambition that you see oftentimes in people might largely be driven by shame. They feel like they don't measure up and they have to do more. A lot of sexual deviance. You look underneath what's going on there, shame is going on there. There's a, a, a form of shame we didn't talk about, I wanna to touch on very briefly. Sometimes it's called false shame or false guilt. And it's pretty much this, this, this position where Shameful things happen to me, and I form an identity around it. I, I believe these things happen to me because I'm somehow worthless. You'll see it sometimes. You may have a young girl who's sex trafficked. This young girl has been abused since she was young by men with their detestable desires and shameful sexual acts they've performed toward this girl. And this girl believes to believe, uh, starts to think, you know what? I somehow deserve this. These shameful things happen to me because I am shameful. And what's happening is that the shame that belongs to them has now somehow been adopted by her. And she lives with this identity. And this can happen to men as well. They live with this identity of shame. And it causes them to seek out certain relationships and certain behaviors. And it's all rooted in this false shame that does not belong to them, but Satan and his craftiness has led them to adopt this. And all that shame, and all the shame that we experience in our personal lives, none of this was God's intention. All of this is a subhuman experience indeed. And we've been ridden with shame, but here's the beautiful thing, but God. Oh, it's so good, but God. But because of the gospel, God has entered into our experience and provided a way for us to be 
brought back to what we were originally created to be because when Jesus died on the cross, he put sin to death and shame is the byproduct of sin. And so through faith in Christ, we now can no longer be ashamed before God, but we can be unashamed before God because we've received a grace despite our inability to live up to his standard. And through this gospel, we move back to what we were created to be, which is naked and unashamed before him. But what about people? What about people? When Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed, it was before God, but it was before one another as well. So how do we get back to that? When they were naked, I mentioned this last week, that, that is talking about physical, but I believe it also is applicable to the spiritual element as well. When they were uh, in the garden before sin, they were fully exposed with one another. So their inner person was fully seen. They were, they were fully known. Nothing was, was hidden. And so in the Garden of Eden, what I'm getting at is that there was this relational intimacy. There was this familiarity, this connectedness that Adam and Eve experienced that is far greater than anything we can imagine. They were fully known and fully secure with one another with no fear or no shame whatsoever. The closeness that they experienced, those days are long gone. There's, that's a distant reality because now we hide to feel secure and we've lost the relational intimacy that God created us for. But God, but God, but God, through sending Christ to the cross, I believe he's bringing us back. He's reclaiming. There's an opportunity for us to reclaim the relational intimacy that we were originally created to experience through the gospel in the church. I truly believe that the church is meant to be a place where we are reclaiming and re-experiencing this, this deep intimacy that God created us for. The, the intimacy that David and Jonathan experienced, the intimacy that Adam and Eve experienced in the church, to some degree, we should be moving closer and closer towards those level of relationships. But it's not going to just happen automatically. It's not just, boom, I'm a Christian, okay, now I'm naked and unashamed before my brothers and sisters in Christ. We're supposed to be moving toward that. And I believe in order for us to appropriate that, there's, there's three, there's more than three, but three I want to talk about today, three steps of faith that we'll have to be willing to take if we're going to step back into the garden and experience the relational intimacy that we were created to experience. And so let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, because in this, this passage, I think Paul, Paul models for us three steps of faith that are necessary for relational intimacy. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Are we there? 2 Corinthians 6? All right, I'll read it. Paul says, We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak to you as my children. Open wide your hearts also. In your notes, you should have that scripture at the top. I want to encourage you to underline, opened wide our hearts to you. That very first sentence, underline or circle, opened wide our hearts to you. So what's happening is Paul is writing this letter to the Corinthian church, and there's some drama in his relationship with them. There's been a a break in their intimacy. Some false teachers have entered into the church and they have led the Corinthians to sort of lose their trust in Paul. They're, they're doubting his goodness and doubting his integrity. And so now they've put up walls against him. And this hurts Paul deeply. He's, he's injured by this because he loves these people very much. And so he's crying out to them. He's saying, hey, I want to be close to you again. I want to restore our intimacy. I, I, I've opened my, wide my heart, but I need you to open wide your heart also. It's a cry for connectedness. And here Paul is modeling something for us that's necessary for our relationships. And these things we're talking about, this applies to marriage, this applies to friendships, this applies to, to parental relationships, it applies to, to siblings. If you were to take what's preached today, consider it, and apply it by faith I believe it would transform your relationships or move them closer to what God desires. I really do. I'm not just saying that. I really believe in what we're talking about. So here's the first step of faith necessary for relational intimacy. It's vulnerability. Vulnerability. 
If you want to experience Garden of Eden type intimacy, you have to be vulnerable. You have to be willing to be vulnerable. Can't happen without it. Again, Paul says, I've opened wide my heart to you. I've given you my love and affection, and I've risked being rejected by you. I've opened wide my heart and exposed myself, and I've made myself vulnerable. And I need you to do the same if we're going to be connected again. The relational intimacy of the garden can't be experienced apart from vulnerability. Remember Adam and Eve, when they were naked in the garden, they were exposed on the soul level. Nothing was hidden. Nothing was covered up. They weren't hiding. Listen, they weren't protecting themselves. Once sin entered into the world, self-protection became our norm. They were vulnerable with one another. They were open to being injured. They were risking getting hurt. And if we want to experience close connectedness, we have to be vulnerable. But this is the last thing anyone wants to do, if we're being honest. Like I said, when sin entered the world, shame came, hiding came, and now self-protection is my natural instinct. And rightfully so. There is nothing holy about being naive about a broken world. If you don't teach your kids to stay away from strangers, there's nothing holy about that. Right? That's, that's, that's foolish. Not talking to strangers or not taking candy from strangers is a necessary, healthy, self-protective thing. Protecting your PIN number, that is a necessary, self-protective thing. Not telling everyone all your business, that is a necessary, self-protective thing. However, on the other hand, isolation from humans is subhuman. That's not how God created us to live. So on one hand, we need connectedness, but on the other hand, we have to protect ourselves. And so how do we marry the two? Here's the deal. Everyone doesn't need to know you deeply. Everyone can't know you deeply, but somebody should. There's got to be a handful of relationships where you go below the surface and you're known on a deeper level. But it's terrifying because if I open myself to you, now you can hurt me. If I give you my heart, you can stomp on it. If I show you who I really am, you can reject me, and that hurts. And it's safer keeping you at a distance. It's safer keeping this relationship shallow. It's safer showing you the presentable parts of me, but not the parts that I'm ashamed of. But if you're not willing to risk vulnerability, you will never experience the fruit of what God has created you to experience. How I grew up, the idea of being vulnerable was nonsensical. It was just ridiculous. Why would you ever want to be vulnerable? Why would you ever want to be exposed to being hurt? As an athlete, vulnerability gets you, lo you lose when you're vulnerable. Literally, the purpose of practicing is to not be vulnerable. Champions aren't vulnerable. Winners don't show pain. You're not supposed to be weak, you're supposed to be a machine. And that mentality God has revealed to me it will make you very successful in athletics. It'll make you very successful in life, but it will not make you successful in relationships. Machines accomplish, but humans connect. Think about it, a machine accomplishes. Tractors dig holes, it accomplishes something. Planes fly, it accomplishes something, but machines don't connect. And when you have this mentality of not being vulnerable with anything or anyone, you will accomplish much but you're not going to connect with people. That mentality, misunderstood or misapplied, it dehumanizes you. It literally makes you more of a machine than a human being because humans were created to connect. I wanna encourage you, if you have an athletic background where you were highly successful in athletics or maybe law enforcement, military, any industry where you have to be tough and you have to be brave, being vulnerable is going to be potentially a challenge for you because it, it sort of contradicts what makes you successful in your industry. But if you want to experience the relational intimacy that God created you for, you've got to be willing to be vulnerable. That's the first step. There's a second step of faith we must take if we're going to experience the connectedness that God would desire. 
and it's safety. Safety or trust, trustworthiness. You might even say grace. Safety, trustworthiness, grace. This is vital if you want to experience the relational intimacy that God made you to experience. Let's think back to the garden for a moment. Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed, so they were vulnerable. Okay, Why were Adam and Eve willing to be vulnerable with each other? This is all speculation. So, I mean, there's probably some biblical grounds to make these things up, but I'm just telling you, these are just, I'm just thinking of different options here, okay? So don't, I'm not saying this is the word of God. But one option that could be of why they were willing to be vulnerable is because they were perfect, right? If, if shame comes from not meeting a standard, well, if you're perfect, you're not going to have any shame because you meet every standard. So it's possible, even probable, that God made them in perfection, and so they were willing to be vulnerable because they had nothing to be ashamed of. They were perfect. That's one option. Second option, I said second option. Second option <laughs> of them being vulnerable is that of ignorance, right? They, they were vulnerable with one another because they were unaware that they could be hurt by each other. This is the same case as a baby. Babies don't protect themselves because they're not aware that you can hurt them. And so if this was the case, if Adam and Eve were, were ignorant and unaware that they could be hurt, then their vulnerability was more so involuntary. It was not of their free will. It was simply a default. They didn't know any better. That's an option. A third option is that they were vulnerable because they trusted one another. They were aware that they could hurt each other, but they trusted each other so much so, they felt so safe and secure in their relationship that they willingly opened themselves at the risk of being injured because they trusted that person loved them that much out of grace. And when you consider us, if we're going to experience the relational intimacy with one another that was demonstrated back in the garden, our only option is number three, trust. If I'm going to open up to you, if I'm going to be vulnerable, I've got to trust you. I've got to trust that you're safe. I've got to trust that you're not going to stomp on me. When you consider like a, a young high school girl, right? she likes, she likes Juan, right? <laughs> She likes Juan. Juan. Juan is. Juan está muy guapo y alto. Juan está fuerte. Right? She wants to share her love for Juan with her friend, but you got to promise you're not going to tell anyone. I'll tell you who I like if you promise to keep it to yourself. That's an appeal for safety. I, I, if, if I open up how I'm really feeling, I've got to trust you're not going to take it and, and hurt me. And so safety, trustworthiness is vital if you want to have intimacy. There's a passage of scripture I want to take you to. The context isn't relational intimacy, but I, I believe it's, it screams of relational intimacy. If you were to apply the scripture, it's, it's anyway, go to James chapter 1, verse 19. Or write down James chapter 1, verse 19. I think it really touches on how to be safe, how to be trustworthy, how to be gracious. James chapter 1, verse 19. I'll read it. says, James says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Whether it's marriage, sibling relationships, coworkers, if you would apply this by faith, you would begin to see more security and safety in your relationships. So let's break this down for a few moments. James says, be quick to listen. My opinion, there's a big difference between listening and hearing. You can use those two things interchangeable, but there's a difference in quality. Hearing takes no effort. For you to hear something, all you have to do is be in the area, and a sound has to happen, and you hear it. Listening is different. Listening takes effort. Listening takes attentiveness. Listening takes you seeking to understand. Listening takes you putting effort into making sense of what that sound is communicating. Anybody ever had the police ever clapped their fly over their house? Nobody. A few, okay? We used to have it every night, almost every night at our old house. It's called the ghetto bird. Nobody heard the ghetto bird before? 
So the person who hears the police helicopter knows, hey, they're looking for someone. The person who listens to the police helicopter knows who they're looking for. It's a difference. When you come to a church gathering, some people hear a sermon. They know the pastor saying something. Some people listen to a sermon. They're attentive to what's being said. They're making sense of what's being said. They're seeing how they can apply to what's being said. There's a very big difference. When it comes to listening, when it comes to seeking to understand, the Bible says you should be quick in this. You should be eager to do this. You should be urgent in this. You should be quick to listen. But if you're going to be quick to listen, you have to be slow to speak. Now let that sink in. Slow to speak. Okay, let me bring some application. Slow to share your opinion. Slow to express yourself. Slow to make a judgment. Slow to interrupt. Slow to put your two cents in. Slow to jump in. Care more about what they have to say than what you have to say. Care more about understanding them than you being understood by them. You do realize that we are socialized to do the exact opposite of this, right? Like, you are socialized to be quick to share your opinion, to be quick to interrupt, to be quick to say what you think, to be quick to give a judgment, to be quick to express yourself, to be quick to give your two cents, because your voice matters. Because all that matters in life and how, is how you feel, because the world evolves around you. But very little attention is given today to teaching people how to listen, how to empathize, how to seek to understand. This is why it's almost impossible to have a political conversation with people today. Because I'm more concerned about you hearing what I have to say and changing your mind as opposed to me understanding where you're coming from. Being quick to speak is our cultural norm, but the Bible says that is foolishness. That's what the Word of God says. Write down Proverbs chapter 15, verse 2. And Proverbs chapter 29, verse 20. Proverbs 15, 2. The Word of God says... The tongue of the wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. You've got to say something. You've just got to express yourself. The Bible says that means you've just got to say your foolishness. You've just got to expose how foolish you are. That's what the Bible teaches. Uh, Proverbs 29, 20. The word of God says, do you see someone who speaks in haste? You see someone who has to share their opinion, who has to express himself, who has to put their two cents in? There's more hope for a fool than for them. Perhaps the reason it's so difficult for us to listen is because listening takes selflessness. It's a selfless act to listen. It's a selfless act to try to understand you at the sacrifice of you understanding me. Listening well means that I put not only my own interests on the table, but I'm looking also out for the interests of others. It's necessary for relational intimacy. Drawing close to someone is largely about understanding them. And you can't understand someone if you're more concerned about them understanding you. Relational intimacy can't happen without you being slow to speak and quick to listen. If you don't mind, go back to James chapter 19, uh, James chapter 1. I'm going to read it again. Let me encourage you too. Don't listen to this thinking, yeah, man, I hope so-and-so is listening. <laughs> Be real. Tell me that's not going through some of your minds right now, right? Oh, I hope so. You, right? You. Worry about you. I've had to have this cook in my kitchen first, right? I've had to look at this and do the deep work of, God, I need your grace. So don't be listening for your whoever. Listen for yourself. James chapter 19, let me read again. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. 
because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Let me apply this to a different context for a moment. Human anger does not produce the relational intimacy that God desires. It doesn't. Anger is a natural emotion. It is not a sin. Jesus expressed anger. God expressed anger in the Bible. The church should be angry about certain things. No doubt about that. However, when it comes to relationships, you must understand that if you want to, be draw, if you want to draw near to someone, anger will prevent that because anger is an intimacy killer. Anger repels. Anger pushes away. Anger produces distance in relationships, not closeness. Anger is not a welcoming emotion. We don't put angry people in front of the church. Welcome to Village Church, right? <laughs> Kindness, gentleness, hospi hos hospitable. Anger pushes away because anger is threatening. And if you're angry, I'm less likely to be vulnerable with you because I feel threatened. We're not going to experience that closeness if you're lashing out or you're feeling that anger. What did the Bible say about God when it comes to anger? Write down Psalm 103, verse 8. Look what the Bible says about God. Psalm 103, 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Doesn't say God is not angry. God gets angry. You violate the boundary enough, you're going to feel it. The Bible says God is slow to anger, abounding in love. God's slow to get angry. He's quick to show love. He's gracious and compassionate. If you don't experience relational intimacy, you need to be abounding in love, not abounding in in anger. Anger is interesting. Anger is one of the few emotions that you can express that doesn't show vulnerability. That's why men oftentimes are so uh, comfortable showing anger, because you're not vulnerable in your anger when you're, when, you're, when you're angry. But deep down, anger, oftentimes, there's more vulnerable emotions. There's insecurity a lot of times behind anger. If I feel like I'm going to be abandoned, or I feel like I'm going to lose love, or I feel like I'm going to lose control, sometimes I'll lash out in anger, but really what's deep down is some sort of insecurity in me. I don't measure up, or I can't, something in me is making me uncomfortable, so I'm going to lash out in anger. Again, men, that's why anger is easy for us. And some women too, but I'm speaking to the men for a moment. But again, anger does not produce the righteousness God desires, and anger does not produce the intimacy that's available to us. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians, verse 6, or chapter 6, verse 11. Again, Paul says, We have spoken to you freely, Corinthians, and open wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak to you as my children. Open wide your hearts also. In your notes, I want to encourage you, circle spoken to you freely or spoken freely to you. Circle that or underline that. Paul spoke freely to the Corinthians. That phrase literally means he, he opened his mouth. So Paul opened his mouth to the Corinthians. What does that mean? Somewhat speculation, but commentators would affirm this as well. It's getting at that he was truthful with them. He opened his mouth to them. He didn't restrain anything. He didn't hold anything back. He didn't uh, 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 withhold anything from them. So he spoke frankly with them. If you look throughout the letter, this is true. He spoke truthfully to them about God. He spoke truth to, truthfully to them about their sin. He spoke truthfully to them about his affection for them. So all throughout the book, he's speaking truthfully to them. And this is the third step of faith necessary for healthy, into, uh, intimate relationships. It's truth. Truth. You can't experience Garden of Eden type relational intimacy without truth. There can be no true intimacy without truth. You can have false intimacy 
but there can be no true intimacy without truth, which means a few things. One, you have to be willing to tell the truth about yourself. You have to be willing to tell the truth about yourself. What do I mean? What you really think, what you really feel, what you really desire, if you're not willing to say that, to tell the truth, you're not going to experience true intimacy. What's going to happen is people are going to connect to a false version of you. It's a false self that you're presenting. So here's some application. This means that people-pleasing actually isn't good for relational intimacy. It's bad for relational intimacy. You're presenting something that's not true. So people are connecting to you, but it's not true. If someone says, hey, does this bother me? Or excuse me, does this bother you when I do this? And you say, no, it's all good, but it truly does bother you. Yeah, there's some sort of connection there, but it's false. You're not being honest. If someone says, hey, do you like this? And you say, oh, I love it. And you really don't? You're being false. Yeah, a connection's happening. A false connection is happening. I did this for years. Honestly, in the name of faith, I thought it was holy to not be honest. I thought it was holy to not tell the truth about how I really felt. But what I realized is that this is just lying. That's all this is. And people are connecting to me in a false version of me. I felt differently. I didn't really want that, or I didn't really like that. But I was presenting something I thought you would like. And with good intentions, I'm trying to spare your feelings. But the reality is, this is false intimacy. It's not true intimacy. What's the balance between politeness and truthfulness? A lot of times when we, when we do this, we're, we're trying to be polite, like it, there's, there's good intentions. So what's the balance between courtesy and truthfulness? If someone says, hey, do I look good in this dress? Should I say no? Or if someone says, hey, do you, do you like this and I don't, should I say no? Like, where's the, how would God behave, how would God have us behave in these ways? We're probably going to touch on that a little bit more next week. We're going to unpack that a little bit. It's not going to be the focus of stuff, but I want, to, I want to touch on that a little bit. But the point that I'm trying to make right now that you need to take from this is if you're not willing to be truthful, you're not going to have true intimacy with people. That's one side of the equation. Another side of the equation, you got to speak the truth, but also people have to be able to hear the truth. You've got to be able to receive the truth. You've got to be able to hear the truth without punishing them. So if you tell me the truth and I don't like it, I can't punish you. I can't withhold love from you. Or I can, but it's going to hurt intimacy. I can't attack you. You can, but it's going to hurt intimacy. I've got to be willing to and able to hear the truth. Are you able to hear the truth? I mean, really. I, just, just so you know, this is my opinion. We're getting below the surface right now. Most relationships, we don't live like that. Most of us have this dysfunctional dance that we just do, where I don't tell the truth, and you don't want to hear the truth, and it works because we're both willing to dance that way. But we're not experiencing what they experienced in the garden. And if you want that, you've got to step out of the norm of dysfunction and into reality of, I'm willing to share the truth, you're able to receive the truth, and when we have those types of relationships, guess what? We start to become more like Jesus. Write down Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 15. I have mastered none of this. I just want to be clear. Like, I'm, I'm not trying to... I am not the standard that you should be following when it comes to this. But I believe it. I'm pursuing it. I will tell you that. And I want to be a church where we're all pursuing this. Ephesians 4, verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach unity in the faith 
and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Paul, so if you're you know, hermeneutics right now, we're talking about growing in, in Christ-likeness. The church is being built up, moved toward maturity. We're becoming more like Jesus. This is what the passage is about, okay? Verse 14, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning of craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Verse 15, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Listen to what Paul says here. The church becomes more like Jesus through the act of us speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love is a grace God has given the church to move us towards Christ's likeness. Don't just pass over that. Like, that's a big deal. If we don't speak the truth in love, we will not grow into the full measure of Christ. What does that mean? It means that we have an obligation toward one another in love to speak the truth even if it's uncomfortable. We have an obligation for their spiritual growth and my spiritual growth to speak the truth in love even if they don't really want to hear it. We've got to care about one another enough to where we're willing to hurt each other's feelings if it means helping us grow into the character of Christ. Because there's nothing unloving about watching someone walk off a cliff. And there's nothing unloving about watching someone removing themselves further and further from God's grace. There's nothing loving about that. Sparing their feelings and letting their soul decline, there's nothing loving about that. But that's the norm in our culture. Write down James chapter 5, verse 19. This is what we're aspiring to, should be aspiring to. James 5, 19. My dear brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. That's true intimacy. I love you enough to tell you the truth. God's truth, not my truth, not my opinion. It's not, we're not a people who just go around sharing opinions. We need God's truth. When someone wanders from what God has laid out in Scripture, we have an obligation as a church to lovingly restore them. That's Garden of Eden type relationship. So I want to wrap up. What I'm trying to get us to see is that there's a, it takes a certain type of person to experience these Garden of Eden type relationships. And I want to show you a person who fits that description really well. Write down Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Philippians 2, verse 5, and then we'll close in a couple minutes here. Okay, Philippians 2, verse 5, it says, In your relationships with, them, with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Listen, the Bible's saying that Jesus was in heaven, fully God, equal to God, robed in majesty and glory for all of eternity, safe and secure. And then he stepped off that throne and put on humanity, became a human, was born as a baby into a poor family, lives a sinless life, and then dies on a cross. What, what is that? Jesus made himself vulnerable. You see that? He was good, made himself subject to injury through the incarnation. Jesus made himself vulnerable. Very interesting. Write down John chapter 1, verse 14. This deals with Jesus coming down from heaven as well. John 1, verse 14. It says, the word of God became flesh. Talking about Jesus becoming human. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, 
the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, listen, full of what? Grace and truth. Huh. So Jesus came from the Father full of grace and truth. Relational intimacy takes vulnerability, it takes safety, trustworthy, grace, and it takes truth. Jesus was vulnerable. He's filled with grace and truth. So what's the point I'm trying to make? If you want to experience the relational intimacy of the garden, you have to become more and more like Jesus. That's what I'm trying to get us to see. The more Christ-like you become, the more you'll be able to experience this level of relationship. The more Christ-like the church becomes, the more we will experience the relationships that God created us to experience. So as we close, where are you at with all this? Not where's your daughter or your son, not where's your mom or dad or your spouse, where are you at with this? Are you willing to be vulnerable? Are you willing to remove your self-protective defenses and allow people into your life? Are you willing to, be, to risk being hurt so that you can be known? Are you safe? Are you trustworthy? If I open my heart to you, are you going to crush it? If I tell you a secret, are you going to tell it to someone else? Are you gracious? Can I be truthful with you and you accept me as I am? And the third one, are you truthful? Can you take the truth? Do you have enough courage to speak the truth? Are you more concerned about people pleasing and keeping things as, or are you willing to really share how you think, how you feel, what you desire? Are you able to hear the truth that people are sharing, or are you going to punish them or withdraw from them or get angry at them or, or deprive them of love? Like, where are you at with all of this? I'd encourage you to really reflect on these things this week. We were created to be naked and ashamed before one another. And my hope is that we as a church would experience these things, these types of relationships, as we look more and more like Jesus and as we seek to reclaim the full humanity God made us to experience. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we are, I don't know, we're going there. We want to go below the surface. We want to move towards transformation. And so would you please give us the grace to not only hear, but to apply. Would you please expose in us areas where you want to grow us? If we struggle with vulnerability, would you please expose that to us? Make us aware and willing to surrender. If we are not trustworthy, if we're not safe, please make us aware and willing to surrender it. If we struggle to tell the truth or to receive the truth or to speak the truth in love, if we are scared to correct our brothers and sisters in Christ, please make us aware of this and willing to surrender it. Lord, if we're dealing with shame, if we have these man-made standards that we have constructed or that we're adopting and that we're living largely an existence of hiding, please make us aware and willing to surrender it. Lord, I want to be a church that is looking more like Jesus. Please, God, make us aware and willing to surrender it's in your name we pray. Everybody sit together. Amen. Amen. Before we close, I want to take a couple minutes. We've been, I don't know, talking about some stuff. And I guess there's, there's, there's an opportunity to seize the moment and to sort of press into it, to, I don't know, do something with it, right? We're talking about shame. We're talking about relational intimacy. And, and I want to, I guess, pause and see if God would want to work some stuff in us or work some stuff out of us or just give him space to do that. So we're going to sing a, a worship song or two. Emma, Emma will give some direction, but really I just want this to be a time where if there's something you need to, if you're looking for a way to, to 
put some feet to your faith and, and take a step of faith in some way, hopefully this is an opportunity to, to do that. And so let's all uh, stand and we'll go from there.